adventure. And Mr. E is holding the animal of the day. Yeah, so this is our red shouldered hawk, um, like affectionately known as Linny after her scientific name, Buteo lineatus, or lineatus, um, depending who you talk to. Um, but the scientific name from Carl Linnaeus, um, who created that nomenclature of naming animals in this fancy way so scientists know who you're talking about. Because if you say red-shouldered hawk, you might not know what bird you're talking about. But if you say Buteo lineatus, you know automatically. It's yeah. right in your brain. How's our voice level out there? Can y'all hear us out there in the world? You gotta speak up. Okay. All right. So remember to ask questions, say hello, tell us where you are, all kinds of good stuff so that we can interact with you and Linny here. So Linny, Linny is um, red-shouldered, as Mr. E says. Hello, Abby's watching. Yeah. Hi, Abby. Linny, Abby's watching you, so be a star performer. Yeah. <laughs> so Linny may look like she's uh, not real right now. She's sitting very quietly on the glove, but she was a little bit... Uh, mouthy earlier she's talking a little bit to us and they have a really interesting call that you might have heard before they have kind of this Kira! Kira! call that kind of sounds a little bit like a crow and a lot of um blue jays will actually mimic their call and so you'll hear them in the forest in the woodland this is a woodland hawk yeah it's pretty um vocal hawk too as mm -hmm. far as repetitive like they'll hear 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 over and over. If you ever feel like, what is that animal? You probably have a red shoulder hawk <laughs> hanging out. And they are really, really talkative, especially around breeding season when they're figuring out their territories for the males and the females who will use the same area to build their nest and maintain that nest for years and years. I think that we looked up some stats and there was one female they found that laid eggs in the same nest for 16 years. What? 16 years, so that's amazing. 16 years, wow, I haven't lived in a house that long myself. <laughs> Hi, Mom and Pops. Hi. Pam Keener's tuning in. Elise, like, Elise our, all, like all of our co-workers are watching us, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Hi, guys. Thanks for watching. You're going to ask some good questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so um, she is a, a bird of prey. Not e -O -P. this kind. Prey. Yeah, she doesn't go to church every Sunday. No. She is a raptor. And raptor comes from the Latin rapper, which means yeah. to see. Uh, grab, grab and seize. So you gotta remember that she is a bird of prey, which means she's a hunting bird, but not all hunting birds are raptors. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and raptors have those three characteristics that make them a raptor. So they have um, three characteristics that define by their morphology or the way that their body looks that let us know that they are raptors. So if you can think of those three things, type them in. Those three things are really important for them for capturing their prey, bird of prey, right? So think about what you would need to capture prey for those three things. Three things yeah. And of course, I wrote a song about it. What? <laughs> a hawk is a raptor, yes indeed. These three things that make them be. I'm not going to tell you, you got to type them in. What are they? What makes it a raptor? Bird of prey, a hunting bird. Because um, we're going to tell you, but we'd rather have you talk with us, share your knowledge, ask questions. Yeah, while we're waiting on the, the answers from you, because we like to ask questions and we like you guys to ask questions as well, we can talk a little bit about why I have a glove on, and that maybe will give you some insight. So the glove here protects my pan from the bird's feet, and those feet are very strong for capturing prey. What else it does is it allows me to hold the bird comfortably and for it to be a comfortable perch for the bird as well. When they perch, they lock their feet sometimes. That's going to keep my hand protected and also keep them stable on the perch. They're so stable though that even when their body moves, their head stays relatively in the same spot. And that allows them to focus on their prey and find their prey easy. Oh yeah, so the answers are coming in, Michelle. Oh, yeah. Good job. Curve, sharp beak, Structure talons, beak. and eyesight. I think you mean exceptionally good eyesight, yeah. right? Good vision, long vision. Awesome. Good job. We knew you could do it. Patty yeah. wants to know, do they have good night vision, Mr. Yeah. E? So 
the red shouldered hawk is basically the companion bird or serves the same ecological role as our barred owl that we talked about earlier in uh, the month, the last month actually. Um, and barred owls basically are the riparian dome equivalent of a red shoulder hawk. So they're going to be out at nighttime and these guys are going to be sleeping. So their night vision is not very well. Small eyes that are really good at focusing long distance and they have binocular vision. Um, and so they can zoom in on things and see what their prey is going to be from far away. But they cannot see very well at night, probably about as well as a human can. Yeah, in fact, nighttime has a magic trick on them. If yeah. you put them in the dark, like you maybe you've heard of putting like a cover over your parrot, your parakeet, um, mm -hmm. any diurnal bird, it's going to si simulate darkness, nighttime, and it'll cause them to calm down, to be still. Because I guess that helps them survive from being yeah. preyed on. Yep. Moving around at night, you get seen. Um, yeah. Good job, Emily. She gets it too. Aspen wants to know a good question, Mystery, about the leather straps on your ankles. Okay, so um, all birds of prey that we work with at Oatland, if they're going to be a glove trained bird, if they're going to be used in programs, have what are called anklets on them. Those anklets are little cuffs that go around their ankle to control the bird while you have it on the glove. Attached to those anklets are a strap. The strap is called a just. I think I have an extra one in my pocket that I grabbed. Maybe not. Jail can show that to you guys. And so that strap basically is what we attach a swivel to. And then the swivel allows the leash and, and anklet to not get twisted with the jess around their leg. So it's very good for controlling them. Also allows them, if they do what's called baiting, to not get twisted up. They can fly around the glove, land back on the glove. Also allows for a flighted bird in a flight program to fly from glove to glove. The dresses are grabbed, and then she's controlled that way. She got a little nervous, my hand coming up to her fast. Do a little demonstration of that flight for you. She'll fly and land back on the glove. I'm going to tuck my hand back down low so she doesn't get freaked out by that. And then she grabs onto those dresses, hooks back in, and under control. So falconry is all about using durable materials to control a bird. So we use leather, and then also these nylon cords as well. Um, do she, Aspen wants to know too, does she mind the straps? I mean, she doesn't mind them too much. Some birds of prey um, that we use for programming um, and other birds of prey that I've met like to tear off their gestures. So they'll actually use their beak and tear them off. She doesn't mind them that much. She just kind of walks around with them and flies around with them on. Sorry, the, the, the red tail is, is taking, stealing the show in the background. Maybe she, we'll star her a little bit. So, um, Finn, you cannot have these as pets. Um, they are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Any native bird to Georgia is protected, including their feathers. Yeah. So when you find a feather, you got to just leave it in the forest and let an, an animal or insect eat it. Um, because if I had this feather, there is no way to tell how I got this. Mm -hmm. And I could have taken the whole bird, plucked it, and sold them. So yep. they protect the bird by protecting every single part of them, especially the bird. Now, Oatland has permits to have these animals. We wouldn't be able to have them without the permits. And so we have to treat them the way that the DNR sees fit. And um, so they come and inspect us. I don't know if you guys knew that. We have inspections here. In order to have our animals, we have to have permits. Um, it's a good thing. George is super protective of um, wildlife, too. If you do want to build a relationship with a hawk, you can get into falconry. Falconry is a sport that uses hawks, especially in Georgia, we use native hawks, to capture prey, you use them for hunting. You can't just keep them as a pet. Um, you can't not utilize them for hunting. That's part of the reason for having them. But this includes a very, very, very long process that uh, requires a sponsor, a known falconer that's licensed to sponsor you then a very long test that you have to study for very hard. And then after that, an apprenticeship that lasts at least a year with you hunting with a bird. And then you can move into a general falconer and you have to be that for five years. And then a general falconer can move to a master falconer and a master falconer can then have most of the birds of prey that you see in the United States as well. Hi, Billy. So, um, <laughs> you know what a hawk's favorite sport is? Um, lacrosse. Hockey. Oh, <laughs> sorry, this is really bad. That was a good one. Um, okay, Ellie, she is called a red shoulder. She does have shoulders. 
Yeah. Um, and they're rough. They're buff colored. Sorry, buff is reddish colored. Um, she just has them tucked in, but they're right there on the top of her wing. Yep. Um, if you actually looked at the bones of uh, the skeletal system of their body, they have all the bones and arms that we have mm -hmm. too. So um, they're just modified into wings. So that's all. So yeah, so she's a red shoulder and she is commonly mistaken for a red tailed hawk. Yep. Especially a juvenile red tailed hawk because they have the banding on the tail like she does. They don't get their red. How long does it take them to get a red tail? Usually like, about a year. Usually about a year. About a year. So their you, first molt. Yeah, so you. <laughs> the, the birds are like come around and warning everybody about her. She's yeah. a predator. Is that fly type tail? Yeah, is, yeah, I don't know if he's warning them, but. Um, yeah, so she has uh, she has the, the similar appearance to the red-tailed hawk, yeah. and a little bit smaller bird. Mm -hmm. She has uh, abilities that the red-tailed hawk may not have as well. Like she can fly through a forest a little bit better than a red-tailed. A red-tailed hawk is more designed for soaring and gliding over open meadows and fields, and um, she can kind of duck, dodge, dive, move in through forests a little bit better. So that helps them not hunt for the same foods, right? Yeah. They're not going to occupy their same niche. Speaking of hunting for food, what time do they eat their dinner, Mr. E? I don't know oh, what they so, do. so it depends on when they are fed, when they eat. So um, with a normal day, they'll get fed probably in the morning between 10 and noon, maybe in the afternoon, depending on if something else has come up for animal care. And they'll eat that food um, fairly quickly if they're hungry, and if they're not very hungry, they'll eat their favorite parts. So they'll typically just eat the head, or maybe some of the viscera, the things that are very nutrient rich. What is the viscera, Mr. E? The guts. Tell our young friends. The guts, the organs. Yeah. Um, the, um, the meaty bits are less desirable. All right. So um, she is full grown. She yeah, is. Sally, good question. Um, yep, Audrey, she likes enrichment. Well, that's kind of enrichment. Um, so enrichment for birds of prey is like basically all having to do with finding food. And so the animal care may place the food in different locations. They might hide it inside of things so they have to mm -hmm. grab after it. But enrichment for many animals that are hunters are very, very, very dependent on the food that they're eating. Melissa, where do you live? You said you have a red-shouldered hawk in your neighborhood. Curious. They usually like to be around water, so if you have a pond or a lake or yeah. something, um, then yeah, I mean, I believe you have them in your neighborhood. I've seen them in, I've seen them out by Whole Foods. I've seen a pair doing their mating ritual dance. It's pretty fancy. It's uh, right downtown, right in the middle of town. Um, Elise uh, That's about wants molting, us right? to describe what molting means. Molt? Molting. Molt. M O L T. Molt, and she's actually going through a molt right now. She's losing some of her primary feathers. Um, that molt process is as they um, go through the year, they might beat up their feathers either with contact with bushes or if while they're hunting, maybe a prey item actually grabbed a feather and broke it. Um, so they want to get rid of those old feathers and get new feathers, and so they molt to replace their feathers. The mark. Yep. Yep. You probably do, Melissa. Yeah, what's really interesting about red shoulder hawk populations, they've actually decreased since um, North American uh, uh, areas through the East Coast have been logged. And so they like woodland forests. As we logged throughout the east, um, eastern half of the United States, their numbers went down. And red shoulder numbers, red tail hawks, went up. So red shoulders went low, red tail went up. That was a crow. She might have got scared by a crow calling. All right. She gets a little afraid. We'll take her back into her enclosure. Um, Don wants to know, do they go after your backyard animals, dogs, chickens? Chickens for sure. Maybe a little dog? Little, little dog, maybe? That's, they, if there's a human around, no. Not this one. Not if there's a human around. Ha Hawks will, not this one. Though. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I maybe. I would say that if you're around, they're not going to come around. Yeah. They'll eat bugs before they'll eat, you yeah. know, a farm animal. Yeah, so common diet items, insects, crayfish, they're going to eat fish sometimes too. They'll eat small mammals, very small mammals, moles and vice, uh, moles, mice, voles, moles, mice, moles, that's not hard to say. <laughs> moles, mice, voles. Um, they'll eat lots of other types of amphibians as well, and they're going to eat quite a few, not a lot of large snakes, but quite a few small snakes. Yeah. Greg, your dad wants to know, how fast can she fly? 
Oh, so. I think it's your dad. In a, in, yeah, double G. Double G. Triple G. Three G. Three G. Greg. Three G network. Yeah. He. Uh, <laughs> so, his question is interesting because, um, like, dives are different than sustained flight. So if they're migrating, they can fly between 18 to 30 miles per hour, maybe up to 35 if they're got a good tailwind pushing them. Um, so they do fly long sustained migrations and they'll fly along the coast or along rivers um, and then in dives which they typically don't do for food but they can they can dive up to 100 miles per hour so um, our red tail hawk next door can go up to 120 and our peregrine falcons can go 150 175 so if their body is built like a plane really super aerodynamic or maybe planes are built like their body probably, jet, better, probably better way to say it or, or fighter jet fighter jet yeah so it depends on how their body is shaped. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Mailer. Um, Aliana wants to know, are they solitary? Um, unless they're raising young, yes. <laughs> yeah, breeding season, these birds come together and they do their thing, hang out with each other, but then they're on their own. Once they, they they'll raise the young for a while, yeah. but then they'll, they'll eat the, for the rest of the year, hunt and gather by themselves. Yeah, and typically for the first three weeks of a nestling's life, the mom's going to stick on the nest and feed her young with food provided by the male. Mm -hmm. Then after that point, both male and female feel comfortable leaving the nest and they'll actually hunt together and grab up food to feed their young as they're getting bigger and hungrier. Yeah, and so Emily, the nests that you would find, um, I don't, do you have a distance or... I don't know about a circumference that um, is like readily available. So like... Um, as big as you can hold your arms in a circle, maybe is a good kind of like that yeah. that around. Yeah, like that's that. probably that's probably pretty big. Maybe yeah. a little bit bigger. Uh, yeah. Um, their nests are often in the uh, crotch of a tree, in the V of a tree, and their nests are very interesting because they nest later than a lot of other birds of prey because they want the foliage to establish above them, the trees to leaf out to give them some camouflage because they get predated by larger birds of prey and even owls, great horned owls, eat their young a lot. Yeah. Um, so we have, we're right next to the farm, Georgia farm, so you might be hearing the roosters singing, call, crowing over there. Yeah. And also the red-tailed hawk has been excited a few times. We'll let you yeah. know about that. Um, so Mr. E has uh, talked really about the glove. Yeah. Can you feel her through the glove? Um, if she binds, if she grabs down, if she squeezes, you can definitely feel. It's not painful. Um, maybe for a larger bird it would be painful, but uh, you can't really feel it when she's just sitting because she's just normally perched. And she could definitely um, pierce your skin, so you yeah. have to let it go. Yeah, for her especially, you know, not as big of grip strength, but some of our larger birds of prey, um, they can put their fingers or their talons straight through your fingers, straight through your hand, into your bone. They're very, very strong. Yeah. Um, John, does she only like certain people? Um, she doesn't really like anyone. Yeah. <laughs> no, she. If you're away from her, she doesn't mind you. But yeah. when you try to get her on the gloves, she gets a little ornery. Yeah. So for whatever reason, Lenny um, has uh, an incomplete uh, history. Basically, we don't know a lot about her. Um, we think that she was an imprinted bird, which means someone tried to raise her when she was young, and because of this imprint, um, she came to us as an adult, basically able to be around humans and not be freaked out and fly away. Humans could approach her. But she had a really interesting uh, aversion to hands. So she doesn't like hands. She's okay with the glove, but if I start moving my hand around close to her, she gets upset by that. So I usually like to talk with my hands. So I have to remember to grab my elbow with this bird. Yeah. Um, do you know Patty Robinson? Yes, I do know Patty Robinson. Hi, Patty. So, so nice of you to tune in. So, um, when you hold a raptor on the glove, the feet are their number one thing you really have to be aware, aware of. If they are footy and grabby, um, that's usually what they're going to do. They're not, they're, the beak, they won't, the eagle will go after you with the beak, but usually that's not their mindset. Mm -hmm. To tear, go after with the beak is the yeah. feet. Yeah. The feet, they're like, I'm strong with my teeth and it'll hurt you. Yeah, seize and grab. Yeah, most um, hawks, uh, and birds of prey, except for our falcons, actually kill with their feet. They kill their prey with their feet by squeezing or footing, driving their feet into it, driving the talons into the prey item. Um, our falcons have a special 
projection on their beak called a tomial tooth, and they'll use that to kill their prey by breaking the neck or sometimes taking the whole head off. Yeah, they're super adaptive. Amelia, why does she puff up her chest sometimes? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I like that question. Yeah, so if she's scared or um, unsure, she's going to make herself as big and as scary looking as possible. So she's going to puff up her chest. Humans do that too. Puff up their mm -hmm. chest, spread their shoulders, spread their arms if they want to scare someone off. She also might puff up her chest to do a little bit of ruffling or rousing, um, and that's going to realign her feathers, maybe shake off some dust, shake off a, a mite or something. If you're a wild bird, you've got a parasite load, you might do that. Um, and then they're also going to preen quite a bit, which is the process of them cleaning themselves, just like a cat licks and cleans themselves. They're going to preen with their beak. Um, let me talk a little bit about their... Oh, hello, Deborah. Thank you for your live... Thank you for thanking us. Yeah. Thank you for watching. We're so glad you're questions. appreciative. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about her eyes, because yeah. some of my favorite adaptations are about her eyes. Maureen wants to know, are they silent hunters? No. No, they're pretty loud when they fly. Let's see if you can hear this. You hear that? Can you hear that on the on the on the thread? So bird hawks make a noise with their wings. Owls are silent. That's yeah. their special adaptation. But going back to the eyes, um, so look at her eye, and I want you to notice a couple things. Notice that she has like kind of a mean look, like kind of like what a venomous snake would have, like a, a, a brow, a brow that's frowning a little bit. Um, that's called the supraorbital ridge. And it's basically the same thing that Mr. E has on his head. Mm -hmm. It's like a visor. Yeah, and brim helps, of a hat. Yeah, it helps to keep the sun out of her eyes because that vision is so important in the daytime. Awesome, you guys can hear it. Um, but looking in her eyes, I don't think you can see this, but she has a super awesome adaptation. In her eyes, there's an oil that is screeded over her eyes, and it allows her to see something amazing. She can see things, bioluminescent, or fluoresce rather, I should say, fluoresce, yeah. fluoresce yeah. in ultraviolet light. So sunlight, things like urine glows mm -hmm. in, in ultraviolet light. You ever tried a black light trick and find out you can see Europe with urine, P for you out there that don't know what urine is. You do, right? You can see it glowing under ultraviolet. So why does that help her? How does that give her an advantage? Why would she want to see P? Anybody know out there? Super cool. So you're, if you're a hunting animal, it takes a lot of energy to get your food, right? You have to fly. Have you guys flown lately? Ha, takes a lot to fly, doesn't it? A lot of your food resources. So she's gonna try to minimize that as much as possible, either by soaring or, or how about sit and perch and mm -hmm. look around you. And if you can see pee glowing on the forest floor, you know you're in a prime hunting spot. And if you don't, you can just keep flying around till you see an active area where there's rodents running around and peeing. And so that is absolutely my favorite adaptation that hawks have. They can see things glow under ultraviolet light. Now that's not uncommon in nature. Um, you guys don't even may know of this bird called the black cap chickadee. Chickadee dee dee, the little tiny bird with a black cap. Well, that black cap actually fluoresces in the light, and they see something different than we see, and that helps them attract each other and find out who's the more attractive bird. Um, and she can see that flash of light in the forest. So she that helps her find chickadees. Um, and she eats birds for sure. Yeah. yeah, Emily, you got it. So she can know where the prey lives. And what's really interesting about this too is that red-shouldered hawks specifically are not necessarily a perch and watch kind of predator. They're going to find a prey item or find a trail and they're going to cruise the forest flying low to the ground and when an animal spoofs and starts to move they're going to change their course really quickly with their amazing long tail, change direction and go down and grab that. So they kind of do this um, flight that they use to ambush prey which is super cool for super cool adaptation yeah. for them. Yeah, the red pill definitely more of us sitting and watching, looking around the, the area and, um, I know. on their perch. Um, so I just had something happen. Something flew by and I wanted to say something about it. What was oh, it? Oh, oh, I just saw a vulture fly by. Ooh, yeah. Um, and you know that 
What's another nickname for Vulture? Anybody know another mis I guess not misnomer, but another nickname for a Vulture? Have you guys heard of Buzzards? Mm -hmm. Well, in England, hawk, this kind of hawk would be a buzzard yeah. and not a hawk. So it's kind of interesting, huh? Yeah, hawk is a very North American a word, uh, a kind of a new world word. When uh, everyone came over and all the languages got mixed up, we started using hawk for birds that are actually closer related to what we think of as buzzards over in England. So um, buzzard is a, a much more um, correct word for them. Um, but we use the word hawk here, um, and that's since spread as well to other yeah. countries. So. I'm looking at her eye again, because I love the eyes. I don't know if you guys can see this on the camera, but she'll blink super fast, like a lightning mm -hmm. shutter, camera shutter speed. And do you notice that she has a uh, um, nictitating membrane, an mm -hmm. eyelid that goes side to side really fast? It kind of gives yeah. her a milky eye for a second. Um, so that's a characteristic that we see in birds and alligators, right? Do you remember our alligator show? Yeah, um, related, right? Yeah, and there was another question I didn't get to. Sorry, we'll get, we're getting it back up here. Eggs, yes, she does lay eggs. Yeah, yeah. They're not fertilized though, unless yeah. somebody visits her. Just like, a, just like a chicken will lay an egg, if you are set up to lay eggs as a bird, um, you're gonna lay an egg in the right season. Yeah. And she's a springtime nester. Yep. So she just kind of worked it out. She just got through it just a minute, just not too long ago. Yep. And then we take the eggs and then she's over it. Yep. After her little cycle. Um, is she a chicken hawk? Nah. Nah. Which one's a chicken hawk? Red tails are chicken hawks. Oh, red tails so, are chicken hawks? So these guys might try to go after a chicken. Um, they're, they're birds uh, that might uh, go after chicken because they're an easy prey item, but that's a large meal that they have to eat and then fly away with um, <laughs> inside their body, and they really can only fly, fly away with, you know, a few mice in their stomach, not a whole entire chicken. So it'd be kind of a waste. Typically, when your chicken is killed, it's a red tail that kills it. Yeah. All right. So good uh, segue. We're gonna move a little bit over here yeah. and see our Artemis, our red tail hawk. dark morph. Yeah. So, but we here, we have, we have three different morphs, right? Mm -hmm. Three different yeah. morphs of red-tailed hawks. So, the number one characteristic, what is it? When you see them, when you know, you look up, you see them soaring, you might have a different characteristic than me. You might notice the red tail, right? The red tail is on the um, upside, dorsal side, what do you call that? Top dorsal, side. Yeah. The dorsal side, yeah. not the ventral side. But when I look, I see the comma marks. She's got, they call them patagio marks yep. on her wings. They're little black commas. That's what I look and know. Because I know that that red tail isn't always there. That red tail takes a year, like Mr. E said, in their juvenile to grow in. So I look for the patagio commas, the patagio marks. You can look for that too. Next time you look up, look for the black commas. I think it's about right on the elbows? Yeah. Right in yep. here. And these guys have a white semicircle under their wing, kind of crescent. Daniel asked, why do they have so many branches uh, on perches? Um, that mainly has to do with them not being able to fly. So Artemis is a unflighted red tail, meaning that at some point in its life, it was damaged to the point where it cannot fly. So Specifically for Artemis, that means a wing amputation. So if you look really closely when you visit next time, or if we get a good shot of Artemis when he, uh, she's perched, you can actually see that wingtip missing, um, and that wingtip had to be amputated because of a collision with a car. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you guys have been listening or heard her earlier when she was vocalizing. That, my friends, is Hollywood Eagle. Yeah. Crazy. It's really hard. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. 
It's really hard to be an ornithologist and watch Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You're constantly going, ah, wrong habitat, nope, yep. wrong bird. Yep. <laughs> but they'll always play the call of a red tail when they show you a soaring eagle. Yeah. Sounds a little bit more, I guess, powerful. Yeah, eagles sound a little bit like a group of laughing hyenas. Uh, <laughs> Whereas red shoulders and red tails have a very distinct, very long, very screamy call. Um, but I think red tails a little bit more powerful, like the trail fish. Yeah, they have that. <coughs> Sounds like a banshee. Yeah. That's what Dawn says. She loves it. She was getting excited earlier when she was calling. That's Dawn, our food friend here. Awesome. Well, um, questions that y'all have out there. We, we have a, a fun Friday fill for you. That's a alliteration. Fun Friday for, for, friends. for food friends. For food friends. <laughs> so um, we're going to have a guest uh, presenter. We're going to yes. have um, Greg Stewart from the um, SIBA, the Chatham, wait, help me out. Coastal, Coastal Empire, Empire Beekeeper <laughs> Association. Uh, no, not Chatham. <laughs> yes, he is going to open a hive with us. And we're going to go inside and look for a queen and uh, learn all about honeybees. Yeah, it's going to be super exciting. So get your honeybee uh, questions ready. Be thinking about other places that you want to see at Oakland, other topics you want us to investigate. Um, and also be looking for these birds. So you're going to see the, the red tail out soaring around. Look for that red tail, very diagnostic. And then look for that red chest on the red shoulder. You might see her as well out. And definitely, definitely keep your eye out for all sorts of new birds as the migratory birds are moving through right now. So lots of color in our forest, lots of new song. So keep your ears and eyes open, folks. Yeah. And there she baits. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you. We uh, hope that you will join our Friends of Oatland if you're not already. And follow us, like us, share us. Yeah, SCC PSS channel 195. Guys. Fun learning you can do. We miss you. Thank you, Arias. <laughs>